welcome again. We are um, the flu killers team. And as you already know, we are dealing with flu shot acceptance and how we can learn from a previous pandemic, namely the H1N1 pandemic. Um, what was this uh, so-called H1N1 pandemic? Well, it was also called the swine flu and it was a virus that were widely spread during uh, June, from June 2009 to August 2010. And it actually was the most recent pandemic um, virus spread prior to, prior to COVID-19. Um, when we have a look at um, the cases that were involved, we actually see that the real number of cases was, um, for, from some estimates, um, up to 21% of the global population that were affected at some point um, during that period. And the US faced a quite tremendous number of that. For the development of the virus, you can see that we actually see a peak um, in the usual influenza, um, which is the autumn and winter. And for the H1N1 cases, they peaked um, already also in the winter time um, and accounted for most of the influenza cases in that um, season. We also see a drop, uh, a sharp drop in, in the cases, in the number of cases, um, which might be also due to the fact that the um, vaccinations against H1N1 um, started in November 2009. Um, the objectives that we set ourselves to the data set uh, we are having and to the problem that we are having was firstly, um, that we took um, a perspective of um, a general perspective of how could we increase vaccination rates for seasonal and pandemic flu in the overall population with the um, end goal of reducing the burden of influenza by decreasing um, hospitalizations, death, and um, any other um, effects on the healthcare system. Second, uh, we wanted to identify factors um, that determine the chance of getting vaccinated, so what actually makes people get vaccinated, and also um, I, I we wanted to identify groups with a lower likelihood of getting vaccinated so that they could be targeted with promotions that, um, or to increase their willingness to get a vaccine. Third, um, we were also interested to see whether there was a difference, uh, whether there was a difference um, between seasonal and the H1N1 pandemic, and we also had a look into comparing the outcomes of that. What are the data or what were the data that we were actually dealing with? Um, we were um, having a public data set um, composed out of um, data from a national um, health survey carried out in the US between 2009 and 10. Um, it comprised 27,000 respondents and the data set included um, more than 35 features. Um, two of them were the ones that were um, of um, highest interest for us that was the vaccination status both for H1N1 and the seasonal flu. And we also had um, um, demographics, um, we had um, a lot of features that target the attitudes and knowledge of people with regards to the season and to the H1N1 flu, and we had um, um, certain healthcare information of the people that were in the data set. Having a closer look at this, um, our, at our data, we observed some um, deviations um, of the distribution with uh, or compared to the um, overall census data from the US. For, so, and we picked out some of them to just show that they are not, um, kind of, they are similar, but there are some differences and age is one of them. So in our data set, we are having a higher share of um, older people while um, younger people are rather underrepresented in, the, in, in our data set. In terms of um, different ethnicities, um, our data set had um, more white people than in the overall population, and um, Hispanics and Blacks were rather underrepresented in the, the data that we in, were investigating. And last but not least, for gender, 
um, we observed that um, we had um, a share of female up to just or just above uh, sixty percent, which is clearly higher than um, the share of fifty by fifty, which can be observed for the general U.S. population. Um, and the hypothesis that we developed out of um, this um, were twofold. Um, on one hand, we assumed that some features would affect the likelihood of getting vaccinated more than others. And we assumed that to be, for example, attitudes and knowledge towards the um, diseases, but also recommendations by doctors. And the second hypothesis we were dealing with was um, that the H1N1 vaccination could probably be taken more due to the pandemic context and the newness of the virus. And what we actually learned from our data um, will now be presented um, by Christina. Thank you very much, Juliana. So I'll start by our deep dive into our data and what we saw. We started off by looking at our target variable of interest, that is whether people got the vaccination for against the H1N1 flu and whether they got the vaccination against the seasonal flu. So one thing that um, came about was our second hypothesis was immediately proven wrong as more people were taking up the seasonal flu vaccine as opposed to the H1N1 flu one. Another point of interest is the fact that when it came to the seasonal flu vaccine, the um, distribution of whether people got vaccinated or not was fairly even, around 50%, but that was not the case for the H1N1 flu vaccine. With the vast majority of people not actually getting that vaccination. So this was an unbalanced data set, which we had to address later on. So then here, we'd like to give you an overview of all the methods that we've tried to get the best prediction model for who's getting vaccinated. And to start off with, we had a look at our data and how much was missing um, after and whether we could fill in this missing data. Um, however, after trying a lot of things, the uh, best um, approach ended up being actually doing no imputation and simply using the full data set, including the missing values and addressing that later on. Another factor was we needed to balance our data specifically when it came to predicting who's getting the H1N1 vaccine because of the imbalance we've shown before. And we've addressed it by downsampling the majority class. So bringing those two groups in line with each other. We've performed feature engineering to essentially get rid of multicollinear features, which is a necessary step during modeling. We explored four different prediction algorithms, but we chose the random forest classifier for further development. A, because it gave very good performance in our trials, and B, because it should, it does work with missing data, which was suitable for us. We've explored different modeling approaches, but ended up deciding to um, develop two models, one for predicting the H1N1 vaccine and one model for predicting who's getting the seasonal flu vaccine. We've opted to include the other vaccine as one of the um, features during our predictions. So that is, for instance, for the model that predicts who is getting the H1N1 flu vaccine, we use the information about who's getting, who got the seasonal flu vaccine as a predictive feature and vice versa for predicting who's getting the seasonal flu vaccine. And finally, we performed hyperparameter tuning for the H1N1 vaccine model to get the best results. So after all of this, you're probably wondering, well, what was the best model? What was it looking like? 
so, but before I can tell you this, I have to explain how we decide what best is. And for that, we used a metric called the AUC score. This is basically a measure of how well the model can distinguish between who's getting vaccinated and who's not getting vaccinated. And with this score, the closer it is to one, the better. Models that uh, uh, do this distinction very well have high AUC scores, whereas models that perform poorly have AUC scores of 0 0.5. And with the two models that we had developed, our AUC scores were in the range of 0 0.8, which is very good to excellent discrimination. So we were very happy about that. But what do we need this model for? Why, why are we bothering with this? Well, what we want to do is input our data and then make a prediction. Well, out of all the information we have, which pieces of information are actually most important for who's getting vaccinated and who's not? How, and so we wanted to identify the important features. So here they are here for H1N1 and seasonal flu vaccine. And so in bold and black are features that were sort of corresponding with each other for each vaccine. So you can see there, there was actually a lot of similarity in terms of which features are important drivers for vaccinations. Um, Getting the other vaccine was the most important feature for predicting who's getting vaccinated. Other important features included whether the participant got a doctor's recommendation to get vaccinated or their opinion of whether the vaccine was effective. However, I'd like to bring your attention to also two features that seem to be specific to each vaccine. For the H1N1 vaccine, having health insurance was actually the third most important predictor, but um, it came way lower in the list of importance when it came to the seasonal flu vaccine. On the other hand, for the predicting who's getting the seasonal flu vaccine, the age group played a much bigger role than it did for H1N1. So then we wanted to explore these important features and how they interact with vaccination status. So here we're looking at the impact that taking the other vaccine has on our prediction. This graph shows this interaction for predicting who's getting the H1N1 vaccine. So you can see that people who hadn't got the seasonal vaccine, flu vaccine also tended to not get the H1N1 vaccine. Whereas if people had got the seasonal flu vaccine, they tended to also get the H1N1 vaccine. So perhaps here we're identifying people who just generally aren't getting vaccinated. And if we basically swap it around for predicting who's getting the seasonal flu vaccine, we see a similar trend. Another very important factor was the participants' risk perception of their chances of getting the flu. So if they thought they had a very high risk of getting either the H1N1 flu or the seasonal flu, um, they tended to get vaccinated. Whereas if they didn't think there were risk of getting sick, they didn't bother getting vaccinated. A doctor's recommendation also had a positive effect on vaccination with, um, so basically after receiving a recommendation, both for the H1N1 vaccine and for the seasonal flu vaccine, people tended to go for vaccinations. Although this effect was seen a lot more in the seasonal flu vaccine, but it should also be noted that before they got a doctor's recommendation, almost nobody was getting the H1N1 vaccine. And finally, um, an important feature was the participants' opinion of how effective the vaccine is. So people who 
tend to think that the vaccine is effective tended to go get vaccinated with that vaccine. It makes sense. And again, we see a much more dramatic impact with the seasonal flu vaccine compared to the H1N1 flu vaccine. So this was an insight into, well, what's important for overall vaccination. But now I'll hand over to Raymond, who can tell us a bit more about what lessons we can ga gain from the H1N1 pandemic and maybe what we can learn for today. Well, thank you very much, Christina. So as you rightly said, a very important question we asked ourselves, ourselves during this um, project was um, how do we apply the learnings uh, in, um, on other pandemics or, or um, on the current pandemic? Well, the first learning which we observe, we observe which is applicable is that um, the, the rate at which or the level at which people were concerned about the virus itself informed the rate at which people got vaccinated. In the same vein, the, the rate at which people were knowledgeable about the vaccine itself also corresponded to the rate at which people got vaccinated. Another learning we could take we could take with us and we could apply it um, now is that um, having health insurance had a very big impact on how people respond to uptake of vaccination. When you look at the left side of the graph, you realize that the people who are not insured, um, extremely few of them are vaccinated. By the way, this is a data from the US where, where not everybody is insured. Um, on the right side, you realize that for people who are insured, quite a huge number are vaccinated. And this goes um, back to, to throw more light on um, what Christina um, discussed with us about doctor's recommendation. So here you could see that on the left side, the people who are not insured, they, the chances that they would go to a doctor is very low. And the chances of them being recommended to get vaccinated by a doctor, a doctor is also low. And the, and, the, and the chances that they will be uh, vaccinated as a result of that recommendation is as well very low. On the right side, it's the exact opposite. So their chances are of, of getting vaccinated is high because they have access to a doctor, by virtue of their possession of a health insurance. Well, a short summary of what all my colleagues and I have discussed so far. The first um, take home is that the uptake of seasonal flu vaccine was greater than that of the H1N1 vaccine. This goes to disprove our second hypothesis, which, um, which, which was that um, H1N1 N1 was supposed to have been taken, that vaccine was supposed to have been taken up more because of the risk involved in, in, in contracting the new, um, the new virus. However, our data and our analysis and our predictions prove otherwise. Um, the second take home is some features are more predictive of getting vaccinated. And Lastly, in a pandemic context, such as the H1N1, and also we could say that for our current pandemic, is that there are some features, features which play more important role in predicting whether people would take the vaccine or not. Well, based on those, we have some recommendations, the first part of which happen to be general recommendations, and the second part would be pandemic specific recommendation. So for the first part, um, we realized that raising general awareness of how contagious a flu um, 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 virus or for any other virus um, um, could be, um, that could encourage people to, to get vaccinated against it. Also, a doctor's recommendation or encouragement could also go a long way to get people vaccinated. Um, finally, um, or 
Again, we realized that uh, educational campaigns to promote the effectiveness of a vaccine could also help people be more sensitive, um, to, to, be, to be more informed to get vaccinated. However, this could backfire if the campaign had been to throw light on the downsides of the vaccine, an example of which we um, experienced with the AstraZeneca which caused even more people to reject the whole idea of vaccination and not just AstraZeneca. Um, now talking about pandemic specific, from our findings, we realized that in such context also specific education about the risk of the pandemic itself could also help people to get vaccinated, um, as well as ensuring that people possess health insurance um, in countries where it's not it's not uh, mandatory, like here in Germany, it could also help more people to to get vaccinated. Well, using our findings and our projects as a bedrock for even better, uh, I mean, more um, advanced um, um, projects, or that using as a foundation which can be built upon to to have even a more convincing. Um, um, to, to get more convincing output, we, we have a number of recommendations to give. The first one is that um, a further exploration of the potential of indigenous variables um, would help make the analysis even more convincing. This means that um, the effect of having one vaccine in the predictive variables um, whilst predicting the other, other vaccine, the effect of that on the outcome should be explored even further. Um, another thing that we would recommend is that a cluster analysis of the features should also be done to um, help identify groups with low vaccination rates, then they can be targeted for uh, vaccination campaigns. As well, we also recommend a sharp analysis um, to be um, done on the clustered um, features in order to help um, know what features are important um, on, a, on a more individual level. And finally, um, how we also want more study to be done on how our predictions translate into disease spreading from influenza and from other um, pandemic diseases. Um, yeah, so we would help, so, the, so certain things would be, would be kept like um, its effects on hospitalization, et cetera. Thank you. So um, to help um, analyze and visualize our data even better, we, we developed a very simple interactive, interactive online dashboard, which connects the visualization um, to our, our data. And um, this we shall demonstrate. So as we discussed earlier on, here you see the first um, chart, which has to do with the vaccina vaccination status um, over uh, its distribution over the whole sample we had. And the second one, we had a concern um, of um, the H1N1 and how it affects the uptake of, of, of the vaccine. And here we could drill down to analyze people who were not vaccinated, people who were vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. The main idea of showing this is to throw light on how it can be rolled out into even um, into other charts that we have and even more um, complex charts. But uh, this is to show how possible that could be and how that would enhance the analysis. Thank you very much for joining us. At this point in time, we would like to invite you to uh, pose your questions or your contributions to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.